There's no shortage of crazy World War II spec op stories. By the nature of the job, Special Forces got up to some pretty daring, unconventional stuff. Sometimes things worked out, other times victory came at a very steep price. One of the latter sorts of operations was carried out in late 1942 by the British Royal Marines Unit RMBPD, which intended to use some kayaks and limpet mines to wreak havoc on some Kriegsmarine forces chilling in France. In this video, we delve into that audacious yet costly raid, a largely forgotten operation codenamed Frankton. By mid-1942, the Germans had been reaping the benefits of their occupation of France for a couple years. But the Allies, of course, weren't just sitting back and doing nothing about it. One of the initiatives the British War Office came up with was the Combined Operations Command and its Spec Ops operatives. As the title suggests, Combined Operations made use of air, sea and ground power, a fact reinforced by the department's insignia which featured an albatross, anchor, and SMG. The primary objective of combined operations was to carry out spec ops raids on German forces operating in Europe. And by July 1942, British Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten had been spearheading the department for the better part of a year. In that same month, a small unit of the Royal Marines, namely the Royal Marines Boom Patrol Detachment, or RMBPD, was formed with British Major Herbert Blondie Hassler in charge. The RMBPD was comprised of 34 men at the time, and they called the naval base Lumps Fort, located near Portsmouth Harbour, England, their home. Hassler wasn't just satisfied hanging around though, so he started cooking up a plan. See, the Germans had been operating out of the French port of Bordeaux, located in the Bay of Biscay, for some time now, importing resources such as raw materials and rubber to fuel the German war machine. Hassler saw Bordeaux as a pressure point just begging to get poked, but what he had in mind was a little unconventional and more than a little sneaky. Originally, dropping them off in a submarine, he planned to take six RMBPD operatives up the Gironde estuary into the heavily patrolled port of Bordeaux on kayaks, stick some explosives on maybe a dozen cargo ships, ditch the kayaks and then flee into Spain on foot without anyone suspecting a thing. In September, Hassler proposed this idea to the aforementioned Chief of Combined Operations, Admiral Mountbatten, but the Admiral wasn't quite sold. He didn't want Hassler, personally, to go on the raid, and he wanted to send out six kayaks instead of three. After Hassler explained why he needed to take part, Mountbatten gave in, and the RMBPD started training in October. As part of their training, they got acquainted with the specialized equipment they would be using in the raid, the most important being the kayaks themselves. These were, more specifically, Cockle Mark IIs, two men collapsible canoes about 4.5 meters or 15 feet in length. Inside each kayak were eight limpet mines, a depth sounding reel, a camouflage net, some rations and water, and a pistol, among other things. When the big day was getting close, 12 men, on top of the defaulted Hassler, were selected to participate in what had been designated Operation Frankton. But believe me, those 11 men drew the short straws. Hassler was assigned the kayak called Catfish, along with his buddy Bill Sparks, while 10 men were assigned the kayaks Crayfish, Conjure, Cuttlefish, Coalfish, and Cachalot. The 13th man was a benchwarmer. On the last day of November, Hassler's unit left Scotland aboard the Royal Navy T-Class submarine HMS Tuna, commanded by Lieutenant Commander Richard Rikes. By the 7th of December, after some delays, Tuna surfaced about 16 kilometers or 10 miles away from the moor of the Gironde estuary. That's when things started to go south, figuratively. While Cachalot was being passed through the submarine hatch, the kayak sustained critical damage, taking one vessel, 
and two men out of the count. Following that, under the veil of night, just five kayaks and ten men began their journey up the Gihon. A treacherous journey indeed. From the get-go, they were punished by winds, cross tides and waves. Coalfish was quickly lost from sight and Conja capsized, forcing her crew to swim to the shore. Catfish, crayfish and cuttlefish went on however, but as they were trying to sneak past the trio of German frigates, cuttlefish failed its perception check and ended up getting separated. Her crew, like Conja's, made for the shore. Coalfish managed to get back up with cuttlefish and crayfish and these three crews focused on putting paddle to water for about 5 hours, after which they pulled over to hide and rest while the sun was out the following day. During this time, unbeknownst to the other two crews, the crew of Coalfish were captured by French police officers. When night set in, Catfish and Crayfish went on as intended, and over that night, and the following three nights, they got closer and closer to their target, despite the estuary's protests. On the night of the 11th of December, Cat and Cray split up to mount their attack on the dock of Bordeaux, with Cat going west and Cray going east. By 12.45am the following morning, Hassler and his crewmate had set all eight of their limpet mines across four German boats and were booking it downriver, on the hunt for somewhere to ditch their vessels and proceed on foot. Cray's crewmen weren't so lucky. The eastern side of the dock was pretty much empty, so they hit a place called Basson instead, using all of their limpet mines on just two vessels. Then they booked it too, and they even managed to meet up with Hassler and Sparks before the four of them split up into pairs once more and set out on foot for Spain. A couple of days later, the French seized Crayfish's crew while Hassler and Sparks ultimately made it to safety via an escape line maintained by the French resistance. But what happened to the other eight men and what sort of damage did Catfish and Crayfish manage to inflict on the enemy? Both answers are pretty grim to be honest. The crew of Conja, which capsized, died of hypothermia on the shore, while the crews of Cuttlefish, Coalfish and Crayfish were captured by German sympathizing Frenchmen or actual Germans and then interrogated and summarily executed. As for the raid itself, the Limpet mines managed to damage, but not fully destroy, six enemy vessels. They also managed to spoil a simultaneous allied operation too. Without delving into it too deeply, a special operations executive agent by the name of Claude de Bossoc had been operating out of Bordeaux since July that same year and had been planning to blast open some ship hulls in the harbour for some time. After Hassler and Sparks' limpet mines went off, the Germans bolstered their defences, inadvertently sabotaging Claude de Bussas' plan, which likely would have done far more damage than Operation Frankton. Combined Operations Command and the SOE were so incredibly clandestine that they didn't even know about each other's plans for Bordeaux. Regardless, Hassler and Sparks received the Distinguished Service Order and Distinguished Service Medal respectively, while Operation Frankton's dead participants were honoured with a number of memorials. In Mountbatten's words, of the many brave and dashing raids carried out by the men of the Combined Operations Command, none was more courageous or imaginative than Operation Frankton. And while the operation may have indeed been courageous and imaginative, We'll leave it up to you to decide if the lives of 8 operatives was worth damaging a few boats. So, do you think Operation Frankton was overall a British victory? Had you heard of the raid before this video? Lastly, do you know of any other kayak based operations from the second world war? Please let us know all that and more in the comment section below.